in three, two, one. All right, guys. Okay, we are live. Okay, but just want to make sure if you guys can hear us. Okay, can you type V in the chat? Okay, V stands for victory because today it's a really a victory night for me. I think I I finally managed to able to have um you know most of the time it's me doing it by myself or sometimes uh, i managed to invite pete up but today on top of being able to invite pete i also managed to interview another professional fund manager all the way from the us uh, so today will be uh, uh, a lot of insights exchange by pete himself as well as by one of the very very great fund managers that i managed to meet uh in omaha when we actually went to uh, berkshire agm this year so i can see people are tuning in i can see ic is here hi good to see you ic all right so without further ado without further ado i'm going to officially invite the key honor speaker tonight and he is none other than matthew peterson hi matthew good to see hi, you matthew. nice to see you chloe and pete it's very nice to be here yeah it's been so it's been like about one month right since we last met wow yeah. it's been one month already yeah one month ago i guess we were in omaha right it yes. was fantastic yes. And that was the first time I met you, actually. That's uh, right. It was very I want to nice. give some context to, to our audience, like how we met. is because when P and I went to Omaha, we were just thinking about what events to go to. There's so many like uh, additional party, uh, additional networking events that you, you can go. And we went mm. to the uh, barbecue, which actually organized by Matthew himself. And he has been doing that for past four years. Every single year he's there. He organized this party so that people who are like-minded, they can gather, all right, to talk about investing, to, to network. I think this is one of the best parties I've ever been. So thank you so much, Peter, for organizing this. <laughs> You're very welcome, Chloe. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and because of that, I get to understand that uh, Matthew himself, he is a professional fund manager. And that's why tonight I also want to uh, really delve deeper into your investment philosophy because your fund has been performing so well, right? For the past uh, 10, 11 years, right? The analyzed return is like 14% year on year. So uh, so like if the investor invested $1 million back then, uh, now their portfolio will have become, I think, close to close to a form 4.5 million dollar or more uh in terms of the fund size so i think that is really tremendous uh, uh work being done there so we want to tap into your insights as well mm -hmm. happy to yeah all right so i can see some of our uh, followers are here as well hi jeffrey good to see you and sebastian now before we get started, maybe I get uh, Matthew to introduce a little bit more about mm -hmm. your work. What made you started? Like, how did you get into this uh, becoming a fund manager right now? Yeah, uh, I can give a, provide a bit of background. So I run Peterson uh, Capital Management in the United States. We actually have a Turkish fund as well, Talis Capital. Uh, and, you know, I spent, uh, well, I studied economics and math and I always... Uh, had this intention of running a fund. So I needed to put the building blocks in place. And after uh, after my undergraduate degree, I went out to Wall Street and I uh, managed to uh, secure job consulting for investment banks. And I spent many years with Goldman Sachs uh, working in the risk management department, uh, doing all sorts of things from, from credit risk management to market risk management, uh, working with a number of different entities. And I, I spent time both on Wall Street and also in London. I was in London for two years uh, during that stretch of time. And, uh, you know, I earned my CFA designation and uh, was, as I said, putting these building blocks in place. And in 2010, I left that role and we launched Peterson Capital Management. And, uh, and so we opened that up uh, to outside investors in 2011. And, uh, and here we are in, in 2023. So we are about 11 and a half years uh, into the fund. And, and you know, we've, we've done very well. We have, uh, we're very pleased with the progress and the firm is growing, the fund is growing. It's, uh, it's been quite a journey and, and it's been a great journey. Yeah, and maybe I just show our audience um, 
like the some of the slides, the information that you actually share with me, which I think it was like really, really amazing. Hold on, uh, where is the PowerPoint? Okay, this is the. Uh, in fact, you guys can also get the this PowerPoint from uh from the Matthew Peterson's uh capital management website as well. So you can see that uh in terms of the fund performance has been really consistent. And in fact, this will be one of the questions I'm going to ask you tonight, uh, which is what is the secret sauce behind how you manage this fund that has been able to generate such a consistent return? <clears throat> well, Chloe, it's a good question. I'm going to uh, almost, I don't know if, it, if it's a, a positive thing here, but I will argue with you that it's, it's not very consistent. In fact, we're quite volatile. Uh, and that is, that's part of the secret sauce. I mean, we have a very concentrated portfolio. We hold the very best companies in the world. The, we're looking for the greatest business models. Uh, it's a value-based fund. So we're looking to pay an extremely uh, low price for the companies that we're buying. We're, we're very patient in that manner. And we also run a very concentrated portfolio. So mm -hmm. with sort of seven core holdings, uh, we, are, we are making this progress. And, um, and we hold them through volatility. So one of the things... We notice, look, we're all over the world. I'm, I'm over here in Istanbul right now. Uh, and it's it's quite interesting to see the dynamic and different cultures and how people invest. So uh, to put it in perspective, we, in addition to Peterson, which you just showed, we have Talis Capital. Uh, Talis is uh, solely invested in Turkish equities. And by the way, these securities trade for currently like PEs of two and three. I mean, it just like an, an amazing opportunities. Uh, and basically when we are looking at these types of firms, uh, we're doing things, we're meeting with the exchanges and things, and we're learning like, um, the foreign investors here in Istanbul, for example, are investing maybe for, uh, 180 to 270 days on average. That's an average holding period. Uh, and they're making some positive returns. We are much longer holders than that, but that is the average for the foreign portfolios. Uh, uh, sorry, for foreign investors, but for local investors, their average holding period is like three days and they're wow. on average losing money. So it's it's about how the <clears throat> mentality is uh, behind these markets. So uh, we are really uh, we are really long term owners of these businesses. So uh, with the I see you've put these down there. There's information on petersonfunds.com if anybody wants to look at those mm. uh, charts you were showing. Um you know, we, we talk about the positions we hold uh, and we do a lot of deep research, but then we hold them for many years. In fact, we, we would love an opportunity to own them forever. So uh, some of the things we've talked about in the past is like our daily journal position and others. Uh, you know, this is like maybe we've been holding it for five years. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll probably hold it for many decades, many, many decades. And, so, and that's, this is the secret sauce. I mean, the, the business <laughs> itself is growing yeah. and mm -hmm. ignore the stock price. The price mm. will follow. Uh, mm -hmm. And the business, as the business grows, eventually the market reflects uh, the value of the business. And so uh, we, we simply hold and, um, and watch the business grow. And we're, we're, we're business analysts and business owners. And uh, as the price fluctuates, it doesn't bother us. It doesn't concern us. It doesn't concern our partners uh, because we've educated them on this. And uh, and so you say, how do you achieve this consistent mm -hmm. growth? But the key, there are stretches where it's flat and volatile, mm -hmm. and there's other stretches where we jump forward. So we don't have control over the price. Nobody has control over the price in the short term. So we're looking for excellent businesses that we can buy at a really great discount with extraordinary managers. And this is the secret sauce. This is the approach that we mm -hmm. take to, to building out an extraordinary portfolio. Mm -hmm. I see. Maybe Pete, uh, do you have anything that you want to add? Uh, yeah. Add so, so Matthew, uh, actually, I was very curious about your fund in Turkey because, you know, of, of all the places, right? And right now, um, Turkey seems to have a bad name in terms of like the, the economic stability mm -hmm. and the inflation that's running quite rampant over there, right? So, so, so what, what in Turkish market that caught your, caught your eye? Okay, well, I have several ties to the Turkish market, but uh, 
So, so my wife is from Turkey and I've uh, been coming to Turkey for many years. Uh, I think the first time I came here was about 17 or 18 years ago now. Uh, and I spend a lot of, I've spent a lot of my adult life here. I mean, uh, I, I spend about uh, probably an aggregate a month or, you know, five or six weeks probably of each year. Uh, and so what originally caught my eyes, I was, I, I, I was out in, it was really opportunistic. I was in Switzerland. I'd been running my fund uh, for a number of years and I was in Switzerland uh, at visiting Guy Spear at the Value X conference. Uh, and I, I'm, I've been a long-term attendee of that conference. And uh, through Guy, I was introduced to uh, Masut Eliotolu, who's uh, mm. like the best equity analyst, Turkish equity analyst globally. He was chief investment officer of ABN AMRO for many years. Uh, he's an extraordinary individual with just such deep understanding of these firms. And it, it's a small market, all right? It's a little mm. bit, it's not like being in the US. It's uh, maybe more like being in, in Singapore. There, there are truly only a few hundred companies that are publicly traded and yeah. uh, the prices are not as efficient. So the market's not as efficient, meaning uh, there's inefficiencies in the market and the prices are wrong. And uh, the prices can be wrong in the short term, but in the long term, eventually the prices match the value. And so mm -hmm. uh, with Masood's deep understanding, we, we just became friends for a few years. I would come to Turkey, we would visit each other and... Uh, and we ended up, uh, he proposed, and we ended up uh, launching uh, Talus Capital. And so mm. uh, that was about five years ago. We have very similar mindsets. Uh, we are truly business owners. In fact, in so what's attractive is it's very difficult to resist things that are trading for two and three times earnings for <laughs> me. I just, I can't believe the opportunities. We can buy the Coca-Cola bo bottling company in Turkey for five times earnings and everywhere else in the world is selling for 20 times earnings. Uh, and here there's much less consumption and a growing consumption of these sugary beverages and things that, that they're selling. So there's actually a lot more growth uh, mm. in this region and the price is much cheaper in this region. So uh, mm. there are so many issues that you mentioned, as you mentioned, Pete, We've just had an election here in Turkey. Erdogan uh, won the election again. And in yeah. the past, there's been some uh, very controversial, controversial is maybe, so there's been some uh, really uh, unconventional economic policy uh, where there's massive inflation, but also lowering interest rates, which, mm. which, you know, in economics 101, yeah. you understand that. Will Does it, doesn't go hand in hand. Yeah. <laughs> That doesn't work well. Uh, but now that this election has passed, our anticipation is that this uh, the administration will now try to stabilize the currency. In fact, there's uh, some new folks in the Treasury. They've put together a three-year plan. Uh, as inflation does stabilize, uh, I think people will realize these firms are, are truly just gushing with cash. They uh, mm -hmm. need the, the right firms. Uh, mm -hmm. it's not, you can't just buy the Istanbul index or the, the Turkish index. Yeah, it's very hard to build buy. with banks. Yeah, it's not it's not the right time necessarily to be buying all the financial institutions. What mm -hmm. you want to be looking for and what we have looked for uh, are firms that are earning revenue in hard currency. Uh, things like uh, we have this company we own Archelic. Okay. Archelic is uh, uh, a manufacturer of all sorts of, of different household goods from air conditioning units to dishwashers. Uh, and they have manufacturing facilities, but they export all over Europe mm. uh, in many other countries, in fact. And so their revenue is coming from exports. So mm. it's actually increasing as there's inflation in like a a lira perspective, uh, but their costs are declining. Any debt on these companies' books based in lira is declining. So mm. uh, there's inflation isn't always a terrible thing if you know how to use it. If you have your costs 
in an inflating currency yeah. and your revenue in a stable currency. In a stable currency, um, yes. You, you find these really unique scenarios. And I think it's somewhat well known that Turkey right now is among or maybe the cheapest market in the world. It is mm. filled with these companies trading for two and three times earnings that are really great firms, many of them operating internationally on a global level. Uh, and, you know, Zorlu Energy is another uh, where, you know, the oil prices have a global price. The lira can uh, depreciate, but their uh, their production oil price keeps a value right? selling in dollar based barrels of oil. Uh, so actually, the inflation does not impact mm. the revenue; it only impacts the cost. So mm. uh, the firms are absolutely. It's quite remarkable when we look at the data. Uh, and Masood and I've been discussing this for like seventy hours straight. It's just remarkable what's happened how much revenue is coming in, how yeah. large the margins are, and the costs are shrinking uh, very quickly. And, and for some of your viewers, they may not realize uh, the significance of the inflation, but uh, you know, 17 years ago, actually, sorry, 12 years ago, um, uh, 12 years ago, it was about 1.3 lira per dollar. Uh, and that was a big, hmm. there was a big event about 15 years ago. It was a million lira per dollar. It didn't start oh. that way, but there was a million <laughs> lira per dollar. And then what they did is they printed new currency and they erased all the zeros. And then they made it mm. one to one uh, or 1 1.3 to one. Today it is 23 to one. So in 12 years, the lira has fallen by, you know, 95%. And mm -hmm. uh, that means companies with costs in lira have fallen their costs have fallen 95 percent so if you mm. can keep your revenue growing and stable in foreign income and your costs depreciate you have a very very unique and special opportunity uh mm. and so the prices can rise considerably very you know it will take a little bit of uh uh i think foreign investors need to recognize the opportunities first, because the local investors speculate a little too frequently. We're well aware of the the gambling mm -hmm. mentality that's taking yeah. place. Yeah. Other than that, uh, when that occurs, and it can occur quickly because there are the election is now over. Uh, mm -hmm. As foreign investors come back in, I think the the markets are like you know maybe eighty percent undervalued. It just it's it's so inexpensive here. Uh, it's it's remarkable. It's a great opportunity. Wow. I, I think that's really amazing insights that we will not be able to get uh, from Singapore. Thanks so much for sharing. And you can see that for Matthew, like even though when they are investing in uh, a country like Turkey, they are still finding great businesses that have very consistent, in fact, growing revenue at the same time controlling the cost. And it's in fact, it's still predictable business, which is what Buffett has been practicing all his investment journey right and that's how he built his riches as well and that's what in fact uh peter uh, matthew peterson has been doing for his fund to grow uh for his clients but i'm also very curious about if we go back to um the talking about concentration right because mm -hmm. uh a lot of time we know that a concentrated portfolio also carries some form of risk right uh, in terms of there will be a lot more volatility as compared to a diversified portfolio. So in your opinion, how do you manage this risk? Like, like what gives you the confidence of concentrating on your portfolio so much? Yeah, I will share with you a few insights uh, uh, that I think are very useful for, for many investors. Most investors... Uh, Unfortunately, most investors are, are educated incorrectly about the value of diversification. Diversification is a really good way to underperform the market. Uh, you, buy, you sort of avoid maybe some price fluctuations to some degree. Uh, but if you buy a number, basically, 
let me take a step back and share this. There's a, there's a, uh, there's, if you look at the Kelly criterion and mm. you look into the Kelly criterion, I've, I actually uh, re-derived the Kelly criterion about uh, seven or eight years ago for a uh, presentation I was doing, actually for myself, and then I presented it. Um, what happened was John Kelly originally was trying to uh, figure out some aspects and, and technological reasons, uh, doing this for technological reasons with AT&T. And he recognized in the Kelly criterion that it worked very well in places like Vegas. And what it basically says is <laughs> if you have a fixed pool of capital and you are allocating capital to an opportunity and you know the probability of uh, success and you know the outcome if you're right, and then if you know the probability of failure and you know the outcome if you're wrong, then there's no longer a subjective allocation. There's a very objective maximization that you can put. And so uh, if you come from that perspective and you look at it, the challenge is that you still don't know the probability of being right and you don't know the probability of being wrong and you don't know the outcome always when you're right or the outcome when you're wrong. Uh, but when, when John Kelly was creating uh, the Kelly criterion in, I think, the 1940s, he was using punch card systems and really old technology. Uh, so I just opened Excel uh, because I knew the concept, the idea, but I just wanted to see for myself. So I opened Excel and I just used the formula and I solved for every outcome. What happens if you're never right or always right? And what happens if you make a hundred times your money when you're right? Or what happens if you lose your money when you're right? Because, mm. you know, you can be right mm. as, as Annie Duke. Annie Duke's a professional poker player. You yeah. know, the outcome isn't always indicative of the quality of the decision. You know, you can make a very good decision yeah. and still have a poor outcome. You yeah. can even make a bad decision and have a good outcome. Yeah. Okay. Luck. So, yeah. That's right. You, you have luck does play some role in this. So you need to evaluate kind of the process, the decision-making process rather than the outcome. Uh, so when I did this with the Kelly criterion, uh, you can just solve for, for everything. And when you kind of narrow it down to something that's realistic, maybe you're right half the time. And Warren Buffett, you might know, has said that uh, one out of three of his investments is his mistake. So maybe yeah. you're not right more than Buffett. Maybe you're not right more than 65% of the time. So now you should be right, like at least half, if you're an investor, a professional investor. <laughs> but maybe you can't count on being correct or having always a good outcome. Yep. Uh, when you solve for this, you see very quickly that the, the profit maximizing outcome, the greatest compounded return mm -hmm. is somewhere between two and 10 positions in your holding. Mm -hmm. When you find a holding that says, uh, if you find uh, that you maybe have a 55% possibility of being correct, and if you're right, you'll make 50% on your money, uh, the Kelly criterion will tell you to allocate something like 25% of your whole net worth to that opportunity. And what happens in risk management that I think many people uh, fail to grasp is that as you introduce new businesses beyond the 10th or 12th or 15th, you are no longer eliminating the non-systematic risk from your portfolio. What you're doing is you're introducing lower returns to your averages. So you've done a lot of the possible diversification with five, six, seven holdings. And when you get into 15, now you should be able to say my 15th best idea is worse than my first idea, my best idea. So skip the 15th and put more money in the first mm -hmm. because you don't get diversification benefits. You do lower your return. So optimizing your concentration to me, it feels like we're very diversified. It feels like, uh, so Talis, we have 12 positions. Peterson, we have seven or eight positions. Um, that feels very comfortable for me. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think 
that's that's optimal. So we are like mm. managing risk very optimally. And yeah. uh, and then we get higher returns. You can get higher returns if you go bottom up, find individual securities with great returns on capital, uh, you know, the ability to reinvest. Ultimately, what we we sort of we look for the greatest business models in the world, the greatest management teams in the world, and then really, really great prices. And if you have those three, they're so it's so hard to find. You can't find 25 companies like mm. this that are cheap, mm. with great managers, with great business models. Mm. Uh, so you have to concentrate. Uh, yep. And that's what allows you to outperform. I see. Mm. Um, yeah, Pete, you want to say anything? You want to ask no, anything? I, actually, that, that was a great transition to my next question, actually, uh, Matthew, because other than learning from Matthew about what you know he holds in the portfolio, very importantly, right, I always find it uh, interesting and also important to understand why people sell their position. So, so Matthew, I, I noticed that recently in your latest annual report is that you're actually um, sold Bank of America, right, uh, which mm. is actually also a, a position that uh, Buffett uh, holds, Berkshire Hathaway holds, uh, to a huge proportion as well. Right. So maybe can you share a bit uh, more about and on that decision and also maybe your outlook on the financial sector as well? Because in Singapore, financial is a huge thing. We have uh, four main banks and pretty much I think everybody has some money in those, in those banks. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's our portfolio is quite unique. Uh, and you're asked. So ideally, we don't sell, Pete. Ideally, hmm. we hold, we by holding in the US, we postpone any tax liability yeah. in a way you get what Buffett would call float. You get, you know, to reinvest the money that would have been paid to tap for taxes. Mm. Uh, so we are typically not uh, sellers of these business, but as, uh, look, we've been running Peterson funds for 12 years. We've always mm. had this long-term mindset, but we are always ev evolving. We are always improving. And um, there are investments in the past that I realize uh, that I wouldn't make today uh, because what we're really looking for are opportunities to make like a hundred X on our investments. And it, a lot of times it will take many years. We're not just speculating on something that's like a commodity is going to go up or cost mm. more or something we're really looking at firms that will compound and are underpriced. And maybe if something's 50% underpriced, but it's growing by 50% a year, there might be a lot of opportunities. So um, when we look at, you know, you ask, why do we sell Bank of America? It's sort of interesting. And you have these right in front of you. Uh, well, you mentioned it's already owned by Berkshire Hathaway, which is totally true. And you also may not know that it's a big part of Daily Journal. Uh, oh, yeah. So in a way, it's a redundant holding. Okay, so mm. we had an opportunity that was a little more short term uh, than is typical. The opportunity was that, uh, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit. I'm not sure how familiar you are with our use of uh, what we call structured value, where we use puts as a tool Options, yeah. uh, yep. to buy the stock. So we use puts yep. to buy, which is very different almost mm -hmm. inverted from what most people think. They think calls are to buy and puts are to sell. We yep. use our puts to yep. buy. Uh, goes, yeah. But when, when we went through the, uh, when the U.S. went through the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and uh, uh, we had all these bailouts, there were special products that were created by the U.S. Treasury, uh, like our TARP warrants. Uh, and TARP warrants were essentially 10-year call options. But because they were so unique and misunderstood, the prices were everywhere. The prices were very wrong. And what we were able to do at one point is just buy uh, Bank of America for basically below book value. And, uh, and the bank was stabilized and growing and Buffett had already made a $5 million investment. Uh, and, and we were able to get a very, very attractive price on something that had some uh, like, really asymmetric uh, capability. So by the time the shares came to us, uh, mm. our expectations of the growth in Bank of America are were not 
really as high as our expectations for the product that we were using for, mm. uh, I guess our holding period was probably five or six years, uh, which mm. for us is very short. So, um, so once we had the shares, uh, you know, the growth wasn't there. It wasn't, it didn't necessarily belong in our portfolio for the long term. Uh, mm. What we're looking for are things, oftentimes they're on the smaller side uh, when mm. we can find them. And so really the reason we exited is it's a redundant position for us yep. because it's embedded in the others and it doesn't have the same growth potential over the long term as some of the others. Uh, mm. So those are a couple of reasons that it's the opportunity cost of capital is very important in finance. So if you do yep. a, you cannot do B and uh, and so, you know, we, we, have to be very selective with the companies that we are owning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the meantime, uh, uh, if the audience here, if you have any questions, you know, you have this very exclusive chance to be able to ask Matthew himself as well. So make sure you type it in the comments. And while we go back to selling put options, right? Because we do understand that in order to get the stocks, you really have to, the stock price do have to fall below the strike price before you can sell, uh, you can buy the stocks, right? So there's this, always this risk of not being able to get the stocks and you miss the upside on it. Yeah. So yeah. how do you mitigate that risk of uh, not being able to buy the stocks eventually? That is a very good question. Uh, and, and there are a number of ways that you can handle that. So first of all, uh, if we talk about options and there's a number of stuff that we have, we have a few different like YouTube uh, presentations and things available on this topic, mm. but uh, we are actually writing. So when we write, I I'm not sure how much your viewers understand all these concepts, but we are basically uh, finding a firm that we want to own in our portfolio. And maybe the price is a little bit higher than we'd like to pay. Or in fact, um, I will go as far as to say this. I never buy shares like a retail investor would. I never, even in my own personal portfolio, most of my money is in the fund, but I never would pay a market order ever. I would almost really never pay a limit order, uh, set a limit order. I always sell a put as a tool mm. by the stock mm. because you get paid mm. a premium yeah. and you get in for below the market price. So, with that concept in mind, the calculation I typically am doing is I'm figuring out the annualized IRR on our premium versus the collateral because we hold the cash to buy the shares. Our intention is to buy the stock. And uh, typically when something becomes attractive, uh, there's a lot of volatility. And that's true in the value investing world. So in value investing, you're always looking to buy the lowest, you know, pay the lowest price. And when something comes down in price, if there's an event that takes place or there's some anomaly that occurs, as things come down and you're interested in buying, there's a lot of volatility. And volatility uh, is part of the Black-Scholes pricing model, which mm. the world kind of forces to, to hold through. So as volatility increases, the price of the, of the contracts increase. So yep. just as something's falling yep. down, you get a much higher premium. And so when I'm always... Uh, a rule of thumb for me is that if I'm not getting double digit IRR in the premium collateral on our, in the premium on our collateral, then mm. it's not uh, something we're interested in. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so Chloe, to your, to answer mm. your question, uh, if the shares run up and we miss them, it's a mm. little, it is unfortunate, but because we've, re we've received an adequate IRR, we can find a new opportunity. So it's, it's, yeah. we still yeah. have had that return. In fact, usually we're just getting paid to wait. We're just getting paid to wait for the shares to come down to our price. Uh, and then if they, a lot of times, so I sort of think that there, I've presented on this a few times, there's sort of four different things that can occur uh, mm -hmm. because our exposure is really to the notional of the shares. We're still mm -hmm. committed to buying the stock. So yep. that's the exposure that we have. So, the very worst case scenario is that we're totally wrong and the shares go to zero. Okay. So let's say there's a hundred dollars stock and we commit to buying it for 80 and they pay us $20. I mean, so maybe I shouldn't use dollars, but what $20. <laughs> so, 
uh, as the shares come down below 80, we're mm. still very happy for a long time. It's like we got $20. Our net cost is going to be only $60. Mm. If the shares were to go all the way to zero, which is the worst case scenario, we would lose $60 by using our approach versus $80 mm. if you buy out from yeah. a traditional limit or market order approach. Mm. So it's still terrible, but it's not quite as bad as, as it could be. Uh, the other few are that it could go down just below 80 and we could buy. And now we've only paid 60 and the market price never even goes to that level. That happens quite a bit. So, uh, and that's the most attractive scenario. The other is that the shares could be at 82 or 85. So we miss out on the owning the shares. Uh, but if this, let's say this was a one year contract. Uh, mm -hmm. We would receive $20 on our $60 in collateral. That's a 33% return. Uh, and we didn't own the shares. And because the shares didn't go up that much, we can actually maybe do it again. So yep. we can mm -hmm. write it on the same contract, same same position uh, a second time. Uh, the, the situation that is second worse, Chloe, that you mentioned, is the shares go to 500 Okay. So, uh, and it feels, you're so right in a way it feels good. Ah, wow. You really know where to find these. Uh, so that's right. So let's say in the, in the fourth, uh, the fourth position here, the shares go up quite a bit. Uh, so we sort of do miss that opportunity, but we've returned 33% mm -hmm. with the math I've given you on $20 yeah. on an $80 strike. And now we may have to find a new opportunity. So it's disappointing, but actually our partners, they don't really realize mm -hmm. they're not disappointed because our returns are positive and good. Uh, so it's, it's actually acceptable. It's, it's mostly that we recognize how hard it is to find these rare gems that are so mispriced. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, you know, it feels like, oh, we have to start again and look uh, all over for another opportunity. But there is one secret. Uh, and, and this is something, this is something we do uh, in specific situations. But when there is maybe like a more of a binomial outcome, or there could be a lot of operating leverage, uh, there are, there are situations where uh, we, we sort of expect if, you know, there's a difference between uncertainty and risk. Sometimes uh, things are uncertain, so prices are down. But once an event passes or uncertainty resolves itself, shares can climb. And when we recognize that that might take place, which is, by the way, kind of what's happening in Turkey, uh, when when we recognize that situation, we can actually use some of the premium that we mm. receive from our puts to buy some call options. And mm. so then we don't miss the opportunity. So mm. we still have net cash inflow. Yeah. Uh, and when you have a, a, a large, a larger amount of capital, you don't have to have a single strike price. Yeah. We can yeah. have more strike prices we can have multiple expiration dates we actually yes. build out an entire matrix around it where wow. we expect to sell we expect to buy some of the puts that we sell but not all of them that's quite attractive because we're like getting extra premium and our cost basis is going down and down and down for that security mm -hmm. um it's quite attractive to buy really long dated call options, call options. Yep. that are deep in the money. Yep. So if, uh, if this hypothetical scenario where the shares are coming to 80 and maybe uh, we think they're worth uh, 600 or something, uh, we could actually buy, maybe we would buy a $50 strike call and we would pay somehow we would find a way to pay like $32 for that. Mm. And, and then we would use some, the, some of the put premium to lock in a little bit of that call. Upside, and of yeah. course, if it goes, if it just goes parabolic, we'll make a lot of money on those calls. And ultimately the intention 
is to own those shares and then really own that business for, yeah. uh, you know, in our, in our documentation, we call this section is like our infinite compounders. So these are companies that we have no intention of selling. We are mm. very transparent with our partners, with the world. We are, we own these businesses when we own one or two or 3% or 5%, we are so pleased to own it. And we are just waiting for that company to grow into the billions and trillions of dollars. Uh, and we'll still own two, three, four, five percent of that firm. Mm, mm. I see. And I'm also very curious in terms of I think you are talking about like these. These are the seven uh, major holdings that your current fund is holding. Yeah. Right? Yes. So when when you are making investment into them, how do you make allocation in terms of oh right right now for example you decide to allocate maybe ten percent in Daily mm. Journal. Or, or maybe ten percent in Berkshire Hathaway. That ten percent, would you allocate some money to sell put, or would you allocate some money to buy stocks? Like, do you separate it, or how how do you do? How do you manage your funds using options at the same time buying stocks? Yeah, there. So uh, it's quite interesting when you get into uh, this level of detail. Uh, very seemingly similar value fund managers actually treat things quite differently at, at these levels. Mm. Uh, so what, what, uh, so what I mean by that is, uh, there are, you know, the, I, I believe the right way to invest and we can even talk at a high level about one of these naspers is actually uh ten cent. Less, <laughs> yes, it's absolutely ten cent but pete the reason why it's ten cent is quite interesting in itself the reason is that they are great capital allocators and they have uh the right philosophy where they've actually made uh many dozens of venture investments mm. all over the world Ten cent just works best. Mm. Yeah. And they never sold it and they never trimmed it. And they're doing a little trimming now. Yeah, a little bit now, yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> but regardless, uh it became ten cent yeah. because they ne because they didn't they allowed the concentration. It's yeah. like what happened with Nick Sleep. Nick Sleep is famous for owning these three securities for so long and then kind of giving it back <laughs> to his investors and saying we're we're just holding these securities it's ridiculous to charge you you, you do it yourself <laughs> your, yeah, here's your here's your shares back but if you read the early letters uh they made a number of investments and yep. what yep. happened was three of them uh grew and mm. they didn't trim and they left them alone so chloe what we're what we're doing is uh we're evaluating you know the opportunity based on there's a lot of it, there's a lot of unique diversification that I think is unrecognizable when you just look at the seven securities. In fact, if you if you open it back up for a second, okay. I'll just uh, for your audience perspective, I'll just tell share with you how a few of the unique aspects. Uh, but we're we're really looking to incorporate things like key diversification. You know, so if you think about Berkshire Hathaway, this is like seven hundred billion dollar market cap. Everybody knows Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. It's a very stable long-term uh, grower. If you look at daily journal, this is, this is a very different type of company, but it's run by yeah. Charlie Munger in this, this whole group, but this is only 400 million market cap firm. Yeah. And they have like 300 million in an equity portfolio. Uh, and we're actually uh, watching more of the software business uh, growth of daily journal, daily journal, uh, you know, this can be a multi-billion dollar firm. It will just take time. So uh, the whole point is, you know, we don't trim Daily Journal. We're not trimming Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Dando here is actually the firm, uh, the Indian focused fund that's run by Manish Pabrai. So we're not invested in the fund. We own the GP of the fund. And, uh, mm. and this is like a 30 million it's actually not public. Okay. So this is like a 30 million enterprise value business and we own a few percent of it. Mm. Uh, so if Dando becomes 
a trillion dollar business, uh, we will still own a few percent of that. And our firm will just be considered Dondo at that point. <laughs> uh, yeah. so it will be a little like the NASPERS story. So, uh, so when we're making a new allocation, I'm thinking roughly in terms of the Kelly criterion, and we're looking for ways to really diversify our, our existing portfolio, like adding something unique and new that will add true diversification, but also incorporate the themes I mentioned before, like this super high quality management, you know, super uh, wonderful business model. Uh, mm. And then we need a low price. So yeah. uh, it's very hard for, uh, it's very hard for value investors, for example, to catch these FANG stocks in the United States. Like all the FANGs ran away from everybody over a decade and it was very hard for anybody to consider them, but some of them come back down. So we're very fortunate to be able to sell some puts on Alphabet, for example, mm. and we accumulate a few shares of, of Google, uh, but that's a very different sort of uh, uh, piece to this larger puzzle. So generally in the Kelly Tritarian, it would make uh, very little sense to have a smaller than 10% mm. position. Uh, mm. And there's a few, there's a few things that I will, I don't mean to go on for so yeah. long. So it loves yeah. me, but Chloe, I will, uh, and Pete, I will, I'll share that. Yeah. Uh, if you there, it's sometimes valuable to have a little toe hold position. So, uh, what we typically do, uh, is we buy, uh, we will start with an allocation of like a 2%. Mm. We will move it to roughly 5% and then roughly 10%. Mm. That is typically our approach and that can right. happen relatively quickly. Uh, and, but that, but that is typically what we're trying, what we're looking at doing is sort of a two, five and 10%. And, uh, and, and if it doesn't ever make it to 10, it's because we've, we've decided to exit, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've learned a little more, we mm -hmm. understand the risks really a little deeper. We maybe understand where our mistakes were or what we were overlooking, uh, because there's usually, uh, you know, analysis and, and opinions on both sides of mm. every investment. So, uh, so we're usually looking to do two, five, 10 and, uh, at 10%, the plan is to sort of continue to hold. Although we, we also, as you get to know the firms, the level that we know these firms, when you know mm. them at this level, it becomes, uh, really attractive at times when you see an event that just pushes the price down <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. we're able to sell a few more puts, maybe out of the money puts and just collect yeah. free premium. Uh, we have a full position in Berkshire, for example, mm -hmm. but a few years ago when it falls to, I don't know, what was the price? Like 170 uh, during, I think it was 2020. Was that when it happened maybe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we just sold puts again because it was just silly. You know, it's just free money. Yeah. Yeah. For us. So it's a little bit irresistible at times, but yeah, this is the typical approach two five ten, 10, and then we just leave it. And mm -hmm. it really, we do not intend to take anything out of the infinite, infinite compounders. Mm -hmm. uh, recently we removed Seritage, uh from the infinite compounder list, which is kind mm -hmm. of this, yeah. it's kind of been uh, studied in the value investing community for a while. And, uh, and the commercial real estate market in the U S caused that. And there's no longer the same growth potential because it's actually going through a liquidation. So, um, so there's reasons that things could get pulled out, but mm -hmm. I tell my LPs, I tell our partners in the fund, uh, you should be alarmed if you see me selling something from our infinite compounder list, you should be very comfortable if we do nothing and you should be panicking if we're selling because I'm not supposed to be selling. That is the entire point of mm -hmm. the portfolio. You need to be long-term. You need to be patient. You know, you've all heard the quotes, like the money's not made in the buying and selling it's made in the waiting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's very true. You need this steadily compounding thing, but to get that steady compounding, you need to withstand some drawdowns in prices and it just, it, it cannot phase, uh, you know, your, 
investment philosophy. Again, you, you need to just uh, sometimes I, I Munger says, you know, sometimes the tide will be with us and sometimes it will be against us and we just keep swimming either way. Uh, yeah. And so we hold these companies and sometimes the price will be going down. Sometimes the price will be going up, but the businesses are growing. They're run by great management teams, uh, extraordinary management teams. And uh, they're, they're very uh, fairly priced, cheaply priced in many cases. I remember when I went to uh, the barbecue party organized by Matthew and when I asked him, oh, how long have you been holding Berkshire? And he said like 20 plus years. I was like, oh my God, that is so much patience. And then he said, oh, I'm just like, uh, as compared to the, the, the those investors at the back, they have way longer than me. I'm like, wow, like there's like a lot of great investors. Like I think one of the key success factor is that true patience and and just like what matthew said money is made in a waiting <laughs> yeah right. that's right i mean i think one of my one of my good friends uh gary dvorak who uh is often on cnbc's now living in china uh i believe he was bringing uh his class from kellogg university in the uh maybe he doesn't want me to say this but i think it was the <laughs> 80s he was bringing them all. And so, you know, he's been holding now for maybe 30 or 40 years. Uh, wow. and there, there are other people. We, we sometimes do a poll in Switzerland. Uh, so I, without sharing too many names, I, I know people who are 50 year holders of, of Berkshire. Uh, I, I believe I bought, uh, I know for a fact, I bought my first share of Berkshire but this was long before they were splitting and things. So this was a B share. I bought it at a good friend's house who was working at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York in 2003. It was 2003. So it's 20 years. Yeah. And that, you know, we own those shares still and, and many more. So we were buying and we are, we are net buyers for the last 20 years. And I think we'll be net buyers for the next 20 years. Yeah, but the net buyers of business, like that's what Warren said, right? Wow. Pete, do, do you have other questions that you want to ask Matthew? No, I, I, I'm, I'm just so happy to, to learn that, you know, the, the, the strategy because just, uh, Matthew just give you some background. Uh, we also share with a lot of our followers that, you know, selling puts to, to get the share and, and even selling call options to get rid of them later on is, is a fantastic strategy, you know, just to get that premium. And you can kind of choose to decide what you want to do with the premium. And and today, I think, Matthew, you shared about using it for core options. So uh, it's very comforting to know that uh, this strategy is also used uh, by yourself as well. You know, it's a kind of a validation as well. Yeah. It's, and, it's very... Uh, okay, go ahead, Chloe, please. Yes, yes. Uh, it's just another question. That, uh, uh, Matthew, you can say first, yeah. Pete, I was just going to add that I don't know if your viewers recognize this, but... Uh, it's it's very valuable what you're teaching and it's and it's really unique it's not well understood uh in fact i used to i, I would go to the uh chicago board of exchange website you know years ago i would visit and and i don't know if they've changed this but uh they would explain on there what is a call and how does it work you can mm -hmm. you know what happens if you buy a call they would explain what happens if you buy a put and then they explained what happens if you sell a call. And then that was, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Never <laughs> said to sell a put. It's so strange. And, uh, and so I, I came to this conclusion uh, totally independently back when I was doing the work at Goldman, I was analyzing some different products for a number of the different desks. I recognized that a bunch of the trading desks were sort of, uh, hedging hedging out each other's holdings and uh and and this concept it's it's very simple it's like algebra uh you get paid yeah. you get paid and now you're you're the denominator is lower so of mm. course your irr is higher it is a yeah. it's very logical it's very rational in fact uh pe people don't realize that yeah. warren buffett does this warren yes. buffett yes. when he was buying coca-cola he was selling puts he was and selling when puts, he was yes. buying Burlington Northern, he sold puts everywhere and then, and then bid a higher price than the strike for the whole company. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You know what, what you can do, but yet even value investors totally 
mm. fail to recognize this. Very good friends of mine, uh, very good investors aren't interested so for, for various reasons. Maybe they're already wealthy. They don't want to deal with it. Or maybe they're, uh, they don't want anything between themselves and the stock. Or maybe it's just a little confusing. But eight, 10 years ago, I couldn't find anybody doing it. I couldn't mm -hmm. find every once in a while I would read uh, an article in Barron's and maybe somebody would get it partly right. Uh, now I think there are a few more people that understand it. People like mm -hmm. yourselves uh, that are sharing with their audience, but because it's, it's so unique, your viewers might think it's common. It's really rare. So <laughs> this opportunity, like people are using the products for the opposite thing and yep. it makes a systematically higher price. There's more demand for puts to, mm. to buy puts and calls than yeah. there is to yeah. sell puts and calls. So you want to be net sellers of these highly priced things. Yep. And it's, you're adding real value to your viewers uh, if they're following your instructions. Thank Thanks. you so Thanks, much. Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, I'm just curious, right? You know, like, yeah. because Warren Buffett always talk about the importance of management, right? Um, mm -hmm. Do you, how do you assess the management like you as a fund manager do you think that you have some exclusive uh insights that like you get to hang out with those management and all this so that it gives you more confidence and and understanding the person's integrity and everything because we yeah. as retail investors how do we assess all this information so uh it's very important because basically what you're looking for what really what you want, you of course want integrity. You want mm. somebody who's being transparent. You want a situation where if there's bad news, they'll tell you. And if there's good news, they'll tell you. Uh, but really what you're also looking for is somebody who has really exceptional capital allocation skills mm. because the role of the top managers is really a capital allocation role, but as you progress through business, that's usually not the skill set that's required to get you to that level. So what happens is you get uh, a whole C-suite of managers who are uh, maybe paid with, with incentives that are not aligned with shareholders. Uh, mm. And then they'll make mistakes. You know, the, yeah. the, the C-suite can, they, if you have a company that's bringing in tons of cash flow, it's these managers that get to direct that cash flow. So, you yeah. know, they could pay off debt or they could buy back stock, right? They could make an acquisition. They can do a number of things with the cash. And that's the decision they have to get right for the business to continue compounding. They can actually destroy capital quite easily if they make the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so where I have started for years, which is a helpful place to start, in the U.S., we have uh, these 13F filings. 13F mm -hmm. filings are done by funds that have 100 million plus under in mm -hmm. AUM. Every quarter, uh, a fund needs to report to the SEC, and that is public. You can just go look it up at, at sec.gov. You can look up the snapshot of what they hold, mm -hmm. and that doesn't help you if you're looking at a high frequency trader because it's reported 45 days after the quarter. Uh, the positions will move. But if you're looking at a very concentrated, well-run value-based fund, they hold eight positions, 10 positions. Doesn't change. Uh, yeah. And they never change. Yeah. And when they do change, it's a really big decision. It's a notable observation. And so if you start, so I've been, I we look at, and now we automate some of this, but we look at about, a hundred different funds that are really strong value oriented funds. And we get a super set of uh, the current holdings each quarter. And it's a big matrix that, that I review. Uh, and we basically come up with the super set. So if there are like 10,000 investable securities in the United States, uh, the efficient market hypothesis mostly is true. Most information mm. in the U.S. is flowing pretty quickly into the stock price. 
Yeah. Uh, there's, it's really unique to find the, the rare thing that's mispriced. So the shortcut is to go through these 13 Fs. You know, if you're looking at what Bill Ackman and David Einhorn and Guy Spear have been doing over the last uh, quarter or years, uh, that's really valuable information because they've had teams of people doing maybe millions of dollars worth of research for a long time. And now they just told you, here's the answer that we, here's the conclusion we have. We bought. Okay. Great information doesn't mean that we have to buy, but we find that there are usually about three to 400 securities in the superset of all of their portfolios. So mm -hmm. we have immediately just eliminated 95% of the U.S. market. It has to be something, and you'll see, not all of our compounders are within this uh, piece mm -hmm. of portfolio, but there are just small uh, breadcrumbs that can lead you to the the other things, if it's not in anyone's portfolio, we need to really understand why the whole world missed it and why we think we are right. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, if you have 300 securities, uh, that's much more manageable. And now we can start evaluating the management and the capital allocation capability of those teams of individuals. So, you know, if you have a Warren Buffett or a, a Charlie Munger, yeah. Uh, running the show, that's terrific. But for example, with Daily Journal, people don't recognize uh, you can go through the board members and you can just see, uh, you know, who is Charlie Munger going to select to be on the board of his firm? They're going to be the most extraordinary people with diverse skill sets. Uh, and they're, and they really are truly special. Like Tom Murphy's daughters on the board, uh, Howard Marks, partner mm -hmm. is on the board. These are exceptional uh, people mm -hmm. with, with great character, capital ca allocation capability, integrity, et cetera. So uh, they oftentimes they just shine out. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's unique to find that skill set. And so when you discover it, it is oftentimes like some dominoes falling, like, wow, if there's this person at the, as the, chairman, who did they select to be the CEO? Then you do some research, you find out that's an extraordinary individual. And then the CFO is an extraordinary individual. They tend to hang out together. Wow. I think what you share with me is, uh, is something that uh, very, very aligns with uh, one of the book that recommended by one of our, our fellow uh, investor as well. His name is Hardy. Uh, Hardy, in fact, also went to your party. I'm not sure if you remember him. He actually yeah. introduced me this book, which is called The Rebel Allocator. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it talk about the importance of uh, capital allocation as well. I think this is a very good book. In fact, it recommended by Charlie Munger, right? <laughs> So, uh, yes, and Jake Taylor is a friend of mine. In fact, Jake was at the barbecue two years ago. I don't think he was there this last year. Uh, do you know Jake? I'm sure Jake would come. Maybe Jake would come on your program as well. That uh, would be great. <laughs> so, so uh, yes, I've read the book. I love the book. Uh, you know, Jake takes a really different approach to yeah. – uh, to, to telling the story. It's much more like a fiction narrative. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's a great, yeah, it's a great story. And of course, you know, Jake's views align very closely with mine. So it's uh, the lessons that he's talking about are the same lessons I'm sharing with you. Yeah, it, it's a wonderful book. Uh, guys can go and read it, you know, go and find out a little bit because I think just like what Matthew said, uh, Jake write it in a way that it's like storytelling. So it's mm -hmm. not like other investment books that you find sometimes it's a little bit hard to consume, but this is very easy to consume. And there's a lot of great investment lessons from Charlie Munger, from Warren Buffett, and he condensed it into a very storytelling format. It's a great book. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. So maybe we have, um, because we also don't want to hold you up for too long. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah, in Istanbul as well. Maybe one last question from one of our followers as well. Uh, sure. And uh, um, the inverted world, he's asking, do you expect a sector rotation from tech into other sectors in the later part of this year? For example, the finance sector. It's a very interesting question because uh, I, don't, I don't always think about it 
that mm. way. Uh, and in fact, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, it's everything you need probabilistic thinking for uh, for your analysis. But I think there's a high probability that a lot of the AI factors and things that are coming online with chat GPT, et cetera, or BARD, uh, that these help fuel further tech growth, uh, mm. maybe in certain spaces. Um, maybe fintech can do uh, well. Uh, but is there going to be like a sector rotation? It's basically asking, will the psychology of market participants shift from technology to finance in Q4 of this year? I yeah. think it's an unknowable answer, a question. It's an unknowable uh, situation. You know, Howard Marks talks about this uh, because Buffett talks about this. Uh, for something to be, and, and a lot of people, I talk about this, you know, <laughs> for something to be uh, really valuable, it needs to be correct and it needs to be knowable. So mm. uh, if you're asking, your, and you need to be able to recognize what is knowable and what is not knowable, because mm. it would be, of course, great to know what interest rates are going to do next year. It would be so nice to know what's going to happen when every, there's threats on debt ceilings or what's going to happen to the Turkish lira. That would all be really, really valuable, mm -hmm. but it's not knowable. Yeah. So it's not something that's worth basing an investment thesis on. You can sort of have an opinion. I look at how the world is operating. I, you know, I have macro opinions and views. Uh, but we don't base investment decisions on those. So I'm not mm -hmm. going out to look for finance firms because I expect capital to move from tech to finance. It's yep. a bottom up analysis. Where are the greatest companies in the world, the greatest business model in the world with really sustainable, large margins that can compound for decades and decades and decades. And I'm somewhat sector agnostic. You know, if it's in Turkey, great. If it's in China, great. Mm. Tell me something in Singapore I should look at. Terrific. We'll look. Uh, you know, if there's something cheap enough in finance that that your viewer has found, sure, go buy that. But I wouldn't base it on expectations of like sector rotations or capital flows. Mm. It's super important and would be very valuable, but it's truly not knowable. How could anybody know? People actually ask quite often, uh, you know, they make assumptions and things based on like U.S. interest rates. R it, mm. Rates are rising. Mm. You know, now we might see that Chinese rates are maybe coming down. We've just seen something happen yeah. there. Of course, knowing what rates are going to do later this year, at the end of this year, people are speculating all over the place. People go on CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg. All they do is talk about what are interest rates going to do? Uh, and it's, they either know they don't know, or they don't know they don't know, but I know, <laughs> they don't know. I know they don't know. And I know actually that Powell doesn't know. So how yeah. do they know? And so these, you know, if it's unknowable, it's not worth making a decision. Yeah, that's the point, yeah. You need to go from the bottom up. So, uh, when you're in the value investing space, you're looking at, uh, you know, Druckenmiller might mm. know, <laughs> or <laughs> he's very good. There's very few people who, who might have this superior insight, yeah. right? He worked with George Soros knowledge. for years yeah. and years. He may know, but he yeah. also changes his mind very quickly. So yeah. uh, it's, it's just something uh, I, I'll say I don't know the answer to that question. It's an unknowable answer, uh, and I would make I would encourage you to make your investments on a on a like a bottom up analysis. So you look at mm -hmm. uh, the unit uh, economics of the goods or products that are being provided, and you analyze what is revenue going to do, and are the margins sustainable, and how much are earnings and 
what sort of multiples are you getting? Are you getting a good margin of safety? Can you sell a put and get a nice premium? If you take that approach, you're much more likely to have a, a successful outcome because those are knowable things. Uh, base, it's a, it's a, I think, superior way to analyze the markets than sort of anticipating interest rates, macro, big trends, sector ro rotations. Those are much less knowable factors. Oh, that's simply amazing. And then you can see that's that amazing. Matthew just really focus on the fundamentals, right? Like the, the true business, is it really a valuable business from the bottom up approach, not based on speculation of like, like thinking about things that he cannot control, but really analyzing what is already out there and, 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 and really see whether it's the business valuable uh, and, and continue to be able to uh, withstand the, the, t the test of time. So I think that is true gem of being a value investor. And that's how he is able to grow his fund so well for the past decade and, and will continue to do so, right? Because it's like an infinite wealth loop. <laughs> that's su okay. super amazing. Thank you so much, Matthew, for coming up Thanks, here. Thanks, Matthew. And, and for those who are interested to find out a little bit more about Matthew's fund, uh, maybe Matthew, mm. you can share with us where can they find out more about you as well? Sure. Uh... PetersonFunds.com is our website. So you can go there and we have a lot of information. Uh, we have a media as a material section. We have years and years of annual reports and, and all sorts of letters that we've written. Uh, we also have, uh, and there's a 2022 letter. In fact, we also have uh, Talis Capital uh, mm. is another place you can go if you want to look at the Talis opportunities, the, the Turkish focused fund. Uh, but I'm also on social media. You can find me. I think it's Matt Peterson CFA is I think my Twitter handle. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. uh, if anybody wants to speak further, I'm happy to, to have conversations and um, uh, they can write me an email, matthew.peterson at petersonfunds.com. Yeah. So I think Matthew has been providing a lot of great insights to his followers as well. So follow his Twitter, follow his uh, YouTube as well. He will definitely be continuing to share a lot of great insights over there as well. And in the meantime, while we are going to wrap up this uh, special live, do you have any, any uh, words of advice to our followers to help them to really continue their investment journey better? Words of advice. I mean, I guess, uh, well, I think what's very important is that people are really patient. They do this bottom-up analysis. They're looking for great business models and great management teams and extraordinary prices. And if you couple that, combine that with selling puts to getting access to firms at below market prices, and then you're very patient and holding for a long period of time, uh, not selling, not panicking when the price moves and watching the business, right? Not watching the price of that business, you will do very well. And, uh, and I also think I should, it's worth saying it is very difficult to outperform the market. Ex professionals fail to outperform all the time. Uh, I mean, I think uh, this, Standard statistics are that 80% of professionals underperform the market each year. And over a few years, the professionals outperforming change because there's a few just speculating and getting it right by luck. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it becomes this very, very small group. So as a retail investor, you need to understand what niche you're having. It's like uh, if you're going to go into a sporting event against professionals, I mean, this is a very competitive place. So you need to find a, a niche opportunity to outperform. Otherwise, you should just be buying the market. It's there's no shame in doing something like that. You will probably beat most professionals uh, by just buying the market, skipping all of this nonsense and going off and doing whatever you want with your life. So, uh, you know, these are kind of two words of advice, but uh, either you need to be bottom up to outperform and of course, maybe it's an enjoyable hobby for people, things of that nature. That's totally understandable. But really, a lot of times people do much better 
if they just buy the market. And thanks for being so honest <laughs> to all our audience here. And I think that is uh, that is truly true, right? Like like um, if we if we don't spend the effort to do the bottom up research, we might as well yeah. be better off buying well the market, market and and let the market to work for us in the long run. Once again, it's really about patience. And I can see so many people are super thankful to your sharing tonight. Uh, some of you say thanks so much for your perspective, for your answer. And Sebastian says thanks. I learned a lot as well. So if you guys learn a lot and really find this video helpful, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it out, or right? share it out so that more people can also learn from Matthew's insights. And I think he has really shared a lot of golden nuggets uh, throughout the close to one and a half hour of sharing. All right, fantastic sharing. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in as well. I know the majority of our audience are from Singapore, from Malaysia, and it's late night, but yet they are still so committed to learn. <laughs> and thank you so much, Matthew, for being here as well. Yeah, we are on the holiday on a business trip uh, to Turkey and yet you're spending your time with us to share all your insights. So, oh, some, some of you are asking what's the book again? Oh yeah, the book, okay, it's called The Rebel Allocator, right? So uh, go and read it. It's a great book and go and follow Matthew. He has a lot more insights that he shared on his social media channel. For example, he can, you can follow his Twitter, his, uh, his YouTube channel as well, or maybe just check out uh, the fun website, right? Matthew Peterson. Yeah, Peterson Capital Management. So with that, okay, we will see you guys in our next sharing. There's a lot more things that we are going to share, uh, give you guys a lot of insights as well. Maybe next round, we are able to bring out another guest, right? From, from the US, that would be fantastic as well. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you once again, Matthew, for being here. Really grateful and thank you, Pete, for being here with me as well. All right, Thanks, so we will see you Keep guys up. in our next live. Thank you, see you.